What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. I'm Dr. Sean Pastuch. I'm your host. Today's guest is Lisa Jaster. Lisa was one of three women who graduated the Army Ranger School in 2015 when it became available to women for the first time. She's written the book, Delete the Adjective, which is designed to help people stop putting themselves in boxes that limit the kind of lives that they're able to live, the kinds of thoughts that they're able to have, and the kinds of things that they're able to do. I figured you can listen to one of a dozen different podcasts where Lisa tells you about her Army Ranger School experience. This isn't one of those. I wanted to give you the opportunity to learn about Lisa, the person who was capable of getting through Army Ranger School. So if you want to learn about parenting, about being present, about being accountable, about meritocracy, this is going to be a good podcast for you. Remember, if you like the show, if you find value from it, go ahead and leave us a five-star review and a rating. That's the lifeblood of the show. Sharing it with your friends is how we're going to grow and continue to bring on the guests that you love to hear from. Let's get to Lisa. Lisa Jester, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm excited to have you. Uh, I'm excited to have you above and beyond because I... I find the character that you exemplify on your social media to be um, very inspiring. And I want to learn about what it took to become the person who you are, who could do all of that without even having to tell people to do it the way that you did it. <laughs> okay. Is that, do, do you follow yeah. me there? I do. I do. I follow you. I, f I feel like most of the people who've accomplished what you've accomplished, who have, I'm assuming we'll find out lived a life like you've lived often turn around and go straight to teaching people what they've learned. And that, that becomes what their entire social media channel is all about and all of that kind of stuff. You're basically just documenting your life on there and it's inspiring to me. That's, that's what I find really interesting. Well, nobody wants to be preached to. And um, it's interesting that you say that because I think the best way to share your story is to be honest and I had someone tell me um, right after I graduated from Ranger School, and I know we'll peel that onion later, but um, if you act like it was no big deal, then people won't believe they can do it. So when you're talking about physical fitness, don't show people doing handstand push-ups and ring muscle-ups. Like, that's awesome. But show everything that has to happen to get there. There's daily workouts. I drive in my car and I work on grip strength because when I shoot rapid fire, my rounds start going down the page and it's because of my grip strength. So people need to see the grip strength work to understand that shooting isn't easy. So that's kind of what I think about when I do post is what is the day to day that makes things possible. What What's so interesting about that is I recently sat down, I, I took over the marketing uh, the VP of marketing role in our company recently. We've, we've been without someone doing that for a year and it's never really been a, a great position for us. And I looked back at what, what are the things I need to be sharing about? And most of it was we need to do a better job telling our story of how we got to where we are so that people can understand that they can trust we've taken all of the appropriate steps to get here. Yes. And so when you, when you say that, it's, 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 it's timely. Good, good. You know, what's really funny is um, one of my friends is is super fit, super successful, and people love telling him, oh, you have great genetics or, oh, you must naturally. It's like, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's great genetics. The fastest person in the, in the world has great genetics, but it's also four hours a day for the last 10 years working on it to become Usain Bolt or whomever we're referencing. You know, it are you, do you follow fighting at all? Yes. Okay. Do you know what Khabib Nurmagomedov is? So he, 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 he was the UFC champion for a while. And one of the things he says now he's a coach. He looks for guys who are a little bit less talented than the most talented guys because those are the guys who are going to endure the suck and yes. do the training consistently over and over and over and over again because they know that nothing is coming easy their way. And typically... I think the most talented people are the ones who are, who are often the most tragic. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, so, so what I mean, you're, you're describing your friend who has all this talent in the world and all this genetics in the world who also put in all of the necessary work to express that. It's, it's the, nobody would have said that to him, great genetics, if he hadn't put in the work because it wouldn't look like he had the genetics. Yes. That's what I mean. Yes, definitely. And definitely. that would be sad. And, and it's crazy because um, our kids have been lifting weights since, since we understood that it was okay for kids to lift weights mm -hmm. and, you know, working on mechanics. So using PVC pipes to squat when they're three and four years old. You know, I'm not trying to to break my kids, but now that my son's a freshman in high school and he wrestles on varsity too, so he's not, you know, number one in his weight mm -hmm. class, but he's number two. He wrestled a guy that last week and he was like, oh, well, he's been doing club for a bunch of years. I'm like, no, he's been, he's been really focused and he doesn't have any more training than you do. He just, when everybody else took Christmas break, he ate one or two cookies instead of seven and he hit the gym. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Anyways, I can get off that. Uh, that no, soapbox. stay on that soapbox. That's, that's, that's the soapbox I want to talk to you about. When I was in high school, I was on the wrestling team, but then wrestling got hard and I got soft. And so <laughs> I, I stopped wrestling and I started doing basketball. Um, but you, you mentioned that I, I love, I love that you're into jujitsu. Your mm -hmm. son is into wrestling. Uh, and from what I can gather, your daughter is into basketball, and I'm not a stalker. Anybody can get, can gather this from looking at Lisa's Instagram. I, yeah, I didn't have to, you know, look up their high school. Uh, and I like the way that you deal with that when he comes and says something like that because it's it's a question of what's the mindset that you're going to have when you go into a difficult situation. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, how did he respond when you said that to him? Um. Yeah. So it was really funny because, uh, these, it was two young kids and they knew that I was Zach's mom because I'm videoing and I wear my heart rate monitor and I'm probably heating up almost as much as the wrestlers are, mm -hmm. but, um, they, they just, then they went through a series of questions. Well, what does he do and how old is he? And, you know, he ended up being three years younger than the kid he just beat. And he ended up being at the low end of the weight class. And so we started talking about strength training and all this other stuff. And the really cool thing was my son's opponent came off the mat and was like, that kid's a varsity wrestler and this is a JV meet. And immediately his two friends were like, he's a freshman. He's 14. He won't turn 15 for another eight months. That's an excuse. So his friends right away um, policed their buddy which is something that I loved seeing because a lot of times, especially I'm a Gen Xer, we talk about these millennials. We talk about the younger generation. Every generation talks about the younger generation mm -hmm. and we talk bad about them, but you have an opportunity to teach them with these subtle hints and these subtle reminders and every generation will police its own in its own way. And the fact that not only did I have an opportunity to kind of teach a lesson about daily work to these young men, but they immediately turned around and looked at their friend and was like, uh, uh, that's an excuse. He's younger than you. He's not as experienced as you. He just outworked you. I love that. I love it for two reasons. I love it because number one, uh, you're the kid's mom who had the negative experience. And instead of saying, yeah, it's okay. You'll, you know, you'll get him next time. I was, well, hold on. You're, you're making excuses here for the reason why you didn't get the results that you wanted. And none of them are real. Yeah. The second is because you'd had that conversation with his friends who then actually had the fortitude to go and share that with him and not allow him to get off of the hook, Yeah, which forces a different behavior next time. Yes. Yes. You're either winning or learning, right? Yeah. And, and I think that a really valuable lesson for people to pull out of that, that maybe uh, is less obvious is that. I think anybody who knows anything about your background and your pedigree would assume your son would never do that in the first place. And in reality, a 14 year old boy will be a 14 year old boy, no matter how many times, you know, mom tells him what he needs to hear. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that story. So before you came on, we were talking a little bit about your background and you are the second of eight kids, correct? Yes. So okay. I have, it's my brother and I, and then my dad and stepmom have six more kids and we can even get into the deep of my mom 
my step brothers and sisters too. But yeah, so I'm the second oldest of eight blood blood kids. And what was your responsibility growing up the number two of eight? So when it was just my brother and I, I was the, um, I was the heel. I was, mm-hmm. I was the one who got picked on, um, by your brother had, or by, by his my friends. brother. Yeah. And I had two older stepbrothers too that lived with us. So I got to be the fourth mm-hmm. and the only girl in the high in, in the household. And then when we went to my dad's house as the oldest girl and the second oldest of eight, there was that, um, there was a big enough age gap between my youngest brother is, uh, was born as I was leaving for college. And um, there's an eight year gap between me and my next sister. So I'm old enough to be almost like that crazy aunt, mm-hmm. but close enough in age where they could tell me things that they probably wouldn't tell someone who was too much older than them. So it was a very interesting uh, role to play, especially because I didn't live with them all the time. Mm-hmm. And did, did your dad lean on you to have those conversations with them or did they come up naturally? I think I probably pushed them because I wanted to be more involved in my siblings life. I really felt like, um, probably because in one household I was the baby and in the next household, I was the more mature one. I think I wanted to have that leadership role. I wanted to, uh, I would braid my sister's hair and try to create moments to have open discussions because I felt like that was something that when I did have it, it was priceless. And when I didn't have it, it was a huge gap in my life. So it was conscious for you. I think so. Okay. I, I guess <laughs> I'm 45 now. I don't remember what I thought. At right. 15. Right. Well, 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 but, you remember yeah. it in that way. So it's, I do. there's something I do. to it. I remember um, my sister, one of my sisters just got married. Um, not this past Thanksgiving, but the year before And I did my daughter's hair the way I used to do Brenna's hair for Brenna's wedding. And I showed her the princess braids and we had, you know, one of those teary eyed kind of giggles because it was, it was one of those things where how you braid somebody's hair doesn't really matter, but it was the moments of sitting on the couch with your sister between your legs and putzing with her hair and and building a relationship from what could potentially be not very much because we weren't always together. Well, I imagine it brought back all of those memories and, and, and and it also probably her seeing you braiding your daughter's hair in the way that you used to braid hers. I imagine was a conscious decision and she looked at it as, as a really thoughtful thing for you to do. Yes. And now she's pregnant. So Mm. all right. (laughs) Family grows. The family grows. Are you still in contact with all of your brothers and sisters? I am. I am. Um, and it's, I'm never as close with them as I'd like to, but I thank God I am one of the few people on this earth who absolutely loves social media and I don't like it for the posting reasons, but to keep in touch with my seven brothers and sisters and, um, stepbrothers or stepsisters and ex stepbrothers and all that other drama, I just couldn't do it. I don't text that much. I don't call that much, but I do have the ability to, to cyber stalk. Mm-hmm. And then we have our family group text, of course, but also it's right after the holidays. So we're all, um, everybody's a little bit closer right after the holidays, depending on your family. Some people are maybe a little more distant right after the holidays, Mm -hmm. but we're closer right now. People are definitely more on mind after the holidays, regardless of how on mind they are. They're, they're more on mind. Um, the reason that you came across my radar is probably the same reason you come across anybody's radar. It's because you were, if I'm not mistaken, the third woman to graduate in op- a special operations school in the military. Is that correct? Yes. So I graduated from Ranger School, which is considered the Army's premier leadership course. And actually the Marine Corps and Air Force, uh, I don't know that I've seen Navy there, but Marine Corps and Air Force also send people to Army Ranger School. Mm. And there's also a um, significant international student population as well. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yes. Okay. So that's what that's what lands you on the radar, right? And then um, I, I find not everybody who lands on my radar becomes somebody who I want to interview. You landed on my radar and then I looked into more about you and I said, it's definitely some, somebody who I want to interview because what I really want to learn is all of the things that led you to becoming the person who would be a graduate of Ranger School uh, as a female, which is not a common thing to do. Uh, no, no. no, certainly not. 
Uh, and then when I got into it, I'm like, oh man, her son wrestles and she, she talks about it in a way that I relate to. She does jujitsu, which she talks about in a way I relate to. She talks about her daughter's basketball in a way that I, you know, I just, I think it's so cool as a parent myself to watch the way that you're doing these things. What was it like? Do you remember when you were young enough that you realized you were different than other people? I have a story to answer your question. Ooh, I like stories. Um, my brother was a musician in high school. So I'm four years younger than my brother. I was in middle school while he was in high school. His band, like rock and roll band, was playing at a basketball game. And it was something really new for my small town to have a band playing at a basketball game that wasn't part of the school. And every time I got a chance, I would just get in the high school and I would run around the halls. And I just thought this was the coolest thing. And I remember my brother kind of yanking me to the side because little sister running around his friends is embarrassing. And he goes, one of these days, you're just going to calm down. Like you're going to learn to chill out. And, you know, that was 35 years ago. And I haven't learned how to chill out yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still running around the hallways rather intense. And so that story, along with the fact that I used to bring not our kids now because they don't have hardcover books, but I used to bring all my books home from school ev almost every Friday, just in case there was something I could do to get ahead for Monday. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a little um, off, shall we say. Well, what's interesting about that, that exchange with your brother is you told me before that your, your specialty is math, mm -hmm. right? And math and art are not necessarily the same cloth. And so for somebody like him, relaxing looks like one thing. And for you, relaxing could very much look like something else. And if you had the foresight as a 10 year old, you might've said, this is relaxing for me. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, and so I imagine that that, that popped up with your friends as you were growing up also, as you went to high school. And if I don't know if you went to college or where you went to college, but did you see that continue to manifest itself where the things that were relaxing and soothing for you, for your friends were just too much or was that never a thing? I feel uncomfortable at ease. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I always hated competing for endurance races or, because you have to relax. Like you have to take time off because endurance uses one modality where if you're doing anything intense a couple days up to it, you're not going to peak on race day. Mm -hmm. And so that taper week, and you do it with strength training events as well, but it's a different type of taper. It's, it's a lot more active in my mind. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing endurance races like triathlons and I had to have a taper week and my mileage went down to like 25% of what it was two weeks earlier, I just lost my mind. I would get sick. I would get really anxious. And, and nobody, nobody knew how to deal with that physical version of what my mind does academically as well. And, and yes, it's, it's been obvious to my friends. I went, but I did go to West Point, um, the United States military Academy for my undergraduate degree. And I would say a lot of people are like me there where they're just, mm -hmm. um, high energy need to be in an intense environment to keep continue to recharge. I think it's almost normal with that crowd. Well, a lot of people don't know West Point is one of the premier universities period in the United States. And, and so to get into a university of that level of prestige, uh, it's not simply signing a letter that says, I want to go to the army. Now let me into West Point. You have to be a certain level of achiever to be able to get yourself in and certainly to graduate with the ability to become an officer and all those things that come with mm -hmm. it. Um, how does that show up socially for you now? And I'll share, I'll share a, a personal anecdote along those lines. I think the number one reason I didn't go to the military is I didn't have the balls because I, I, I find so much value from the lessons that I, I of, of the people who I know who went through it and did it at a high level. When I'm with friends now, and I talked about this on a podcast recently, I'm not interested in being around anybody who is not pursuing excellence in something. And that could just mean an excellent parent. It could mean an excellent husband. They don't have to be trying to cure cancer or, you know, start Apple. 
but they have to be looking at things from a really, how do I get better at being me than I am right now perspective or it's boring and uninteresting to me. Yes. Do you find that for yourself? So I do a lot of keynote speak speaking. It's, it's something I've done. Um, I enjoy talking to groups, um, but I don't, I try not to be preachy. We kind of started on Mm -hmm. that line. talked about my Instagram. I try not to say, Hey, this is what I did do this as well. But when I tell my Ranger school stories, I would say nine times out of 10, when I give a speech, somebody stands up and asks the question, well, what would you say if your daughter says she wants to be a stay at home mom, not work, et cetera, et cetera. And I have the same answer every time. As long as you're all in and you're the best damn stay at home mom, I don't think that's any higher or lower than what I'm doing. It is completely on par. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to be, just be the best at it. And you can't, not you shouldn't, but you can't be the best at everything. And, you know, this is a great time of year in January where we discuss New Year's resolutions. I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I do goal setting. And back in November, I cleaned my bathroom mirror and rewrote my goals because that's where they live on my bathroom mirror so that I can't brush my teeth without seeing my goals. And the first thing I wrote is be present. And if everything underneath that fails, but I'm present with my family who, you know, I only got a limited time with these kids in the house. Um, My husband, on the other hand, you know, he's going to be around forever, God willing, but uh, (laughs) I still need to be present with him. So he does stick around. If I fail on everything, but be present, I have had a successful year, month, life, whatever I'm looking at. And so I did the same thing. I talked to my kids. We had a really long weekend of tournaments. Um, My daughter also plays volleyball. She also does jujitsu and wrestling. My son is pole vaulting right now. So we're driving back and forth between all these different lessons and tournaments. So in the car, we were having a big discussion about how we wanted to be a little bit better. We weren't setting resolutions. We weren't even setting goals. And so last night at tuck in, and I literally did this last night, I wrote on the kids' bathroom mirrors. We clean the mirrors during the day, and I wrote on in big letters, get straight A's, and my daughter wants to clean, keep her room clean. She's just, it's every Sunday night, she's got to spend an hour cleaning her room where she could just pick it up for five mm-hmm. minutes a day, and it would be nothing. And my son wants to let her in a varsity sport and get straight A's. So, you know, that's what it says on both of their mirrors, and, and it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, you know, people need to work at being a little better at something every day. And you can't, I mentioned it when, when I was talking about tapering for a race, I can't work out for an hour a day, every single day. Number one, I'd kill myself. And number two, I'd never improve, but I can work out five or six days a week. And then that same hour is used for spiritual growth on the seventh day or reading or whatever it is that, that makes you a better person Every day, just a little bit. I have a lot of questions from what you just said. The first one is, I want to acknowledge something before I forget because I I didn't write this down. I had a mentor once who asked me, are you married? And I said, yeah. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah. He goes, you're a hundred, there's no way that your wife is somewhere else filing divorce papers right now. I'm like, I would be really surprised if that was what was going on. And he's like, you'd be surprised, but are you a hundred percent sure? I said, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I can't be a hundred percent sure that's the case. He's like, well then in that case, if you value your marriage, I would recommend waking up every day and earning the ability to keep it. And you mentioned that, you know, your husband will be around forever, but you have to be present to want to make him want to stay around forever. And I just wanted to make sure people heard that because I think oftentimes we have the ability to take for granted the relationships that we're, that we're in that are the closest. Yes. And those I believe are the ones that require the most effort and deserve the most effort and that have the highest ROI on that effort. So I just wanted to acknowledge you having said that, that I I heard all of that in it. (laughs) Uh, Yes. And and that's the hardest relationship because at the end of the day, I'm tired at the end of the day, when he, it's just him and I, 
I don't want to engage anymore. I'm done. And you have to be conscious. You have to be deliberate in that relationship. You're mm-hmm. so right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you want to be present. That's your number one goal for the year. How will you know if you were successful? And the reason I ask that question in this way is I find that when I talk to people about goal setting and when I talk to people, ask them questions, I'm not teaching them goal setting. When I ask them questions about how do you know if you're doing a good job, all of these things, there's a lot of room for what I like to call unconscious incompetence. Meaning um, people who tell me all the time, I'm a, I'm a great coach. I'm like, uh, you're a teacher full time and you coach two to four classes a week and you care about the people you coach a lot. But are we really going to call you great if you're spending all of your spare time becoming the best teacher you can possibly be? So how do you know if you were successful at achieving your goal of being more present when presence isn't intangible? For me, it's, there are uncomfortable conversations as a parent. We'll use parent because that's easy. And I've got a 14 year old boy. Mm Mm-hmm. Having a 14-year-old boy who is willing to talk to me about uncomfortable things means that I'm present. So if I can continue to have open and honest conversations with the man cub, I think that's a good indicator. It's not direct, but it is definitely a a KPI, a key performance indicator, Mm -hmm. that I'm probably making myself available. My daughter is 10. 10 year olds, preteens. She's not quite a preteen, but she's got all of the symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing. Can she, can I go through a day where she hates her mother because that happens? And when it's time for tuck in, she's still mad if I don't give her a hug and a kiss and snuggle with her for a little bit. Like it's really, in, I guess the biggest indicators to me will be if they want me to be around, then they know I'm there. I'm there for them. May I make an unsolicited suggestion? Please do. I think if you produced a list of KPIs for presence that you have as a wife, as a mother, as whatever else is important to you Mm -hmm. and published it, it would be, uh, what's the word? It it would be more valuable than, than anybody could perhaps assume it to be. Okay. I'll take that challenge. I put but, it on my to-do list. But, uh, cool. I'm thinking about it for myself. Uh, Cause one of my big things, I actually set the goal a couple of years ago uh, when a different mentor of mine asked, how do you know if you're successful? Period. Like, how do you know if you had a successful day? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know. He said, well, I think you should have criteria for it. And so yeah. for me, the criteria ended up being, I can get home at the time by 5.30 p.m., put my phone into a drawer in the house, and go for a walk on the boardwalk in the town that we moved to as a family for the beach without thinking about or talking about work at all. If I can do that, I've had a successful day. It means I got out on time. My phone was elsewhere. I'm talking about something that I have to actively listen and engage with. That means I'm not thinking about something else. Yes. Um, And that became my daily success criteria. And I would be really interested to learn some of the things that you find to be indicators that you're, that you're actively present. I like that. That's a good challenge. Good. Um, Next one is you talk about your son wants to get straight A's and earn a varsity letter this year. Yes. How do you, how do you mother that? when both of the things he's describing are outside of his immediate control, right? He can, he can try to earn a varsity letter, but a coach has to bestow it on him and he can try to earn straight A's, but he might end up with a B plus in something. And then what happens to the rest of the year? How, how do you mother that? I think it goes back to where we started with the wrestling discussion or jujitsu. It's you're either winning or you're learning. And we did struggle first semester. He takes all pre AP classes. I'm super proud of my kids. So I'm not even going to hum brag. I'm just bragging. Oh, I can tell. Uh, I love it. I, I adore them. And, you know, if they were successful in other things and not successful in sports and athletics, I would still be bragging about whatever that is. So I promise I would brag, brag, brag. Okay. Now that I got over the seven deadly sins and just threw that out there, um, 
you know, he, he did, was doing poorly in a class and we had to go through, not poorly, uh, poorly for him mm-hmm. is something that he has um, attributes where it should not have been a hard course for him. He didn't really like the teacher. He wasn't putting the effort in. He said it was hard to learn from that teacher. I said, okay, so you have the internet, you have all of these other resources. How can you not self-teach? And we used his potential B, which he did raise to a 90 um, by the end of the quarter. But we we used that as a great learning. And had he had not set the goal of getting A's, he wouldn't have reached for it. He might have been happy with the B+. Plus. I don't want him to be unhappy with the B plus, but I want him to continue to push himself. And had he ended with an 89 instead of a 90, not officially an A, then I would have been okay with it because he did change his behaviors. He talked to me about, um, mom, I don't know what to do. Well, have you gone in for additional instruction with the teacher before school? Have you asked if there's extra credit available? Have you asked your teacher if they're gonna drop the lower grades? Have you expressed a need to have other resources? Have you said things like, hey, the way you teach, I'm not absorbing. Is there another resource? Which, you know, teachers love that, but kids aren't going to aren't going to ask those questions unless we as parents guide them in that direction. I was in college before I understood that not everybody learns the same way. And I was slapped in the face by the fact that this teacher was throwing information at me, but it was not, it was not absorbing and I didn't have time to self-teach. But after a couple of C's, I finally figured out that, okay, I have to go in and ask for additional instruction. I need help learning sometimes. And hopefully my son's, because those are the goals he's setting, um, hopefully he'll learn those lessons as a freshman and sophomore in high school instead of a freshman and sophomore in college when your grades really matter. I think I want to go back to the 89 instead of the 90 because I want to make sure that we tease it out for people and I want to make sure I understood it properly. What I think you were describing there was whether he gets an 89 or a 90 to you is inconsequential. Whether he understands the reason that he got an 89 instead of a 90 when a 90 was possible yes. is paramount. Yes. And yes. I, I love that because it's, it's, it's a lesson in self-awareness. It's you could have gotten a 90. You said it was important to you. And you did these things and omitted these things with the awareness that they were there, which means you actually didn't want the 90 as bad as you said you wanted the 90. And that's okay. It teaches us a little bit about the kind of goals that we set for ourselves and the standards we hold ourselves to. I, I like that. I find it interesting. Well, I think we can transition that into, you know, the hot topic of the day, which is work-life balance. Mm. And you mentioned it earlier when you were talking about putting away your phone, mm-hmm. you, you closed work at five thirty and opened life. Well, with this, I, you can come into my home any time of the day or night because we now have Zoom and all the other teams and all these other methods to connect after hours. So even jobs that were once having to be left at the office are now 24-7 jobs. So how do we decide when we're going to push? And going from that 89 to the 90, there are also times when you have to say, okay, I could make a 90 in two classes or I could make a 95 in this class and an 89 in this class. Or, you know, it's going to take all of me to get straight A's, but it'll take a little less of me to get straight B's, but I can do all of these other things. When do we make the conscious decisions within our life to understand everyone has 24 hours in the day You don't make time for anything. You choose what to spend your time on. And and where is that cutoff? Is 90 good enough? Or is is the lesson learned what's really important? I'm curious how you would have uh, handled me as a kid. (laughs) I did not, like, I mean, when I tell you, as long as I was getting through that year, the grade I got was completely meaningless to me. Um, but I wanted to be great at other things. 
Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, I mean, you can't know how you would have handled having me as a kid at the time. And I had great parents. I have absolutely no complaints. My parents are my first role models, my first mentors and my enduring mentors. Mm. Uh, so there's no, there's no complaints there. It's, it's, it's always interesting to me though, to, to learn about just the way that people interact with the people who are closest to them, especially when your, your life is, is one that other people who don't live in your house when listening to you at a keynote or whatever they are would never take for granted. And then you have this 14 year old and this 10 year old at home who were like, mom, you're, you're a mom. Right. 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 Do you remember when you were making the decision about going to Ranger school and telling people about it? I do. What was I that do. like? The the reason I ask is I'm I'm curious if it became one of those you know stop dreaming situations and and if it was how you handled it and if it wasn't um how you were telling people So I already said I love social media for a lot of a lot of reasons but when I got goaded into putting my name in the hat for Ranger School and I I very specifically chose those words. Yes, I did get goaded into it. Um, I took it to Facebook and I, I said, Hey, what do you guys think? And I, I just threw it out there. On and Facebook? Course, this must have been the early days of Facebook. Well, not that early, 2014. Oh, all right. So you, it's fairly recent. Got it. It was after your career a little bit. Yes. I, yes. I was, I was 37 when I went to Ranger School. Which, wow. So the average age is 22. Um, but I was 37 when I went. I didn't realize okay. it was all that recent. Go ahead. Yes, it was. Um, so, so I was, I was on Facebook, threw it out there. I had, of course, all my friends, family, college classmates. Oh, of course, if anybody's going to do it, you're going to do it, Lisa, if, you know, just blind support. Right. And I you had, have exactly what it takes. You're like, what yeah, you? <laughs> I haven't seen you in 10 years, but you're perfect for this. Right. Um, but one of Alan's good friends from high school's wife, Alan is a husband. Is, is Alan husband? is the husband. Okay. Alan is my husband, friend of his from high school, his wife. Right. Writes on my Facebook. She's like, nope, you shouldn't do this. You're a mom now. Like you have your priorities. You chose to bring littles into this world. If you're not there for them when they're little, they're not going to come to you with the big things when they grow up. And you were active duty at the time. Yes. No, I was reservist. I was doing this part-time. I worked for Shell Oil Company and did one week in a month, two weeks out of the year. And that was it. I owned one uniform Okay. and it was the old style uniform. It wasn't even the most recent uniform. Um, It was terrible. Terrible. I was completely, because I had taken, um, I had a five-year break in service. So I left active duty and was nothing, um, had nothing to do with the military for five years. And then jumped back in in three years, or this is two years after that, I find myself signing up for ranger school. And, you know, this wonderful woman, love her to death, was like, you should not do this. Your children should be your priority. You set up a life. Um, and, and quite a few other comments um, pushing back. And and again, you know, this is this is Facebook and this is when you're still accepting friends and there's not bots and whatever. Right. So you these know, are the, the golden days of Facebook. Yes. These are, these are actually good people, real people that I know closely. And I'm going through this with, with her and her husband and my husband, we're all sitting on our respective couches, them in another town. And we're, we're all fingers of fury on our smartphones talking about whether or not I should go to ranger school. And it was really good for me to have somebody who didn't agree with my choice because it made me think through all the what ifs, like what if I go and fail? What if um, my kids are mad at me, which is actually the reason why I have a book is because I took notes every day um, because I wanted the kids to know why their mom was gone and what she was doing. And there was no way to express that to a three and six year old, three and seven year old at the time is I couldn't make them understand why I was gone. So I took notes and all of that came from this one Facebook debate that was just a a back and forth of what do you think you're doing? And it's, I, I think I'm trying to, I think I'm trying to do the right thing. I think I'm trying to be the best version of myself. 
I've always said I want to be a leader and this is the army's premier leadership school. Well, I want to go. Was she, was she respectful? Oh, completely. And still a friend. So, um, and I believe that true friends are the ones that can argue. That's where Um, I was. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. Finish your statement. Just if you argue with me and I mute you or unfriend you, then, then I'm just screaming down a, a tunnel. I'm not, I'm not growing and you're not growing. I love the friends that can be red faced arguments. And then we walk away and share a glass of wine. Yeah. The, what you're speaking to there is the width of circumstance that you're allowed to be your friend within, you know, the the difference between um, I voted independent and you voted Republican or Democrat. And so we can't be friends anymore because despite the 9,999 data points that we should be friends, there's one that says we shouldn't. And that's the end of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a funny story about that. We actually, my husband and I, I voted, I voted Democrat. He voted Republican or something like that. It was, it was one election once. And I came home and my, um, my son was like, are you guys going to get a divorce? (laughs) That's, that's what the news cycle has taught us is that that means that you just can't be together. I was like, "Mm, no, these, and, and it was great because I could describe, these are the issues that are important to me. These are Mm -hmm. the issues that are important to your dad. And therefore we're voting based on the issues that are important to us. Did being away at ranger school with two little kids at home, did, did those kids at home weigh on you as a reason to stay and finish? Or was it something that you had to battle as a, an easy excuse everyone would understand to ring out? They definitely were a reason to stay. Um, and I say that to say I could have never come home and looked them in the eyes and said, I quit. Like, how, how could it be the type of mom I am where I force my kids to, I force my kids are competitive. It's, it's genetic, Mm -hmm. but I push them into competitions. I push them to do things that are uncomfortable on a regular basis. Well, what kind of, what kind of human would I be? Not just parent, but human. If I said, Hey, you guys got to challenge yourself, but I'm going to give up when, when things get hard. Mm -hmm. So interesting. It's interesting. The thing I find interesting about it is the way you would do that, if you chose to do that, would be to say, you know, while mom was there, um, I was evaluating all of the reasons that I was there as compared to the reasons that I could have otherwise not been there. And I decided that this was no longer important enough to me to pursue. And so I wanted to come home and be with you. And I think that they would have understood that too. And when they were facing a challenge, it would be a question of, is this important enough for you to pursue? Or is it something that you're prepared to give up? That's, that's how I wanted to play the steel man of the other side of the same argument, regardless of which way you went there. Yeah. Um, cause I find that fascinating the way that the brain works, you know, how, how does this social influence actually influence you? Cause it can go either way. So the interesting thing is I have a term or I have a saying, I say, don't let the quit in. And the problem is If you quit once, it's easier to quit in the future. Now, that being said, there are times you should quit. There are definitely times you should quit. That deadlift when your back's rounding, please quit. You could probably get up 350 pounds, but just stick with a 340 PR. You're good. You know, there are times you should quit for sure, but you have to have quit criteria. So, so this is, this is two halves of the same coin. Letting the quit in. It means if I had quit ranger school, what else out there could I have said, no, this is too hard? Uh, when, can, when is it okay? And for me, if I decide ahead of time, I'm going to do this, then that's when I already decided I'm not going to quit. Mm-hmm. But like I said, there are times where you should just walk away. An unhealthy relationship. There are lots of times where quitting is okay, but what is your quit criteria? And I have to think about my quit criteria before I start. Mm -hmm. And 
in my case, um, and it was it, it was an old infantryman, um, a good friend of mine's dad, Colonel Bill Martinez, he's now retired, actually said sent me a little note and said, set your quick criteria. And he said, make it something really, really hard. Make it the only way that you make it be something that if you quit and you walked home and you had to look your mother in in her eyes, you could say, I quit because of this. And she wouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed. And for me, it was a compound fracture in my lower body or immediate family member passed away. And that was it. Anything else I can struggle through. I ended up having shoulder surgery after I got home. Um, So I I did get injured for sure. My dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer when I was there, but he was still alive. And I knew he wouldn't want me to come home. That was my quick criteria. And in all honesty, I don't know that I would have quit even if um, if there was any way to continue, because I think I think pushing through is what would have made people proud of me. I'm not saying quitting is wrong, but I'm saying your quick criteria better be something that you can live with forever. So you don't have any regrets. I love that you said a compound fracture because it's a really specific kind of fracture. Yes. <laughs> None of that hairline nonsense. We're going to run on that. No, 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 no. You can duct tape that. <laughs> Um, do you have those conversations with your kids now? Quick criteria. Okay. And was your husband military as well? Yes. Yes. He's a, uh, he's a reservist in the Marine Corps. How was the conversation around like, Hey, by the way, just so you know, like this means you're a single dad for how long is, how long is Ranger school? It's supposed to be nine weeks, but I did it in six months. Okay. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) You know, this means you're a single dad for six months. Yes. Yes. He, you know, so first of all, with us both being military, it's always been a risk that one of us would deploy. And, and so I actually deployed for almost all of 2018 as well. So I was gone most of 2015 and all of 2018. To where? Um, Iraq. That was okay. my second second vacation to Iraq. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's always been a, a real thing to us. And so some of the the couple's conversations that others might find morbid um, are kind of natural to us. We, we had our wills set up before we ever even got married. Like we we've always discussed these types of things, but um, he's my number one supporter. Obviously Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything I do without having uh, team Jaster behind me. And when I got in the cab to go to the airport on the day I left for ranger school, Alan said to me, my husband's name is Alan. Uh, Alan said to me, he's like, okay, Lisa stays here. Major Jaster is getting in the cab. And that was a very, very great way of saying, I got this at home. Like there's, there's nothing at home you need to worry about. You put on that uniform and you become the person you need to be to succeed. That's cool. That gave me the chills. That was good. So you end up writing, delete the adjective. Yes. January 31st. Yes. That's when it comes out. Um, what does it mean? Cause to, you know, I had to look up, I forgot what's an adverb. What's an adjective is very uh-huh. an adjective or is very an adverb. It turns out that's an adverb. Adjective yes. is great. Excellent. Things like that. So why, why delete words like excellent and great and outstanding? Why, why eliminate those? So it's specifically um, the ones that put us in boxes. You are a white male. Mm. And what you do always follows that. And and so for me, it's a female soldier or um, I'll get called middle age. So I like to I like to work out. Um, And so I'm going to go and lift weights later today. And then while my son's pole vaulting, they have a little quarter mile stretch right in front of it. I'm going to run sprints. I do eight quarter mile sprints and it's my workout while he's pole vaulting awesome. and it sucks. And my husband's like, I guess you're taking him to pole vaulting. I'm like, I'm not going to, I don't want to sprint, but you know, that's what I do. And, and people be like, well, you're fast for your age. I'm like, you know what? I'm actually, I'm actually pretty fast for a lot of ages. Mm-hmm. actually, uh, <laughs> And And yes, I understand that there's differences for, you know, women and the fastest woman in the world is not competitive with the fastest man in the world. And I get all that. But when you're talking about work, 
And so ranger school is a job. It's a school that supports my job in the military. I don't want to be a female ranger school graduate. So I wrote a book about being a female ranger school graduate that says, I don't want to be a female ranger school graduate. Um, well, it's, 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 no, I follow it. it. It's, it's, I didn't want lower standards because yeah. I was born a female than the standards that you would ask a man to pass. Cause we're going to have to do the same job when it comes down right. to it. So yes. just allow me to be a ranger, not a female yes. ranger, not a yes. female middle age ranger. Yes. Like if I'm, if I'm fit for the job, I'm fit for any part of the job. Yes. And I'm okay if I'm not fit for the job. But right. it's not because I'm a female. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the stories I draw out in the book is, you know, there I was I went to the school. I gained some weight for the school. So I went in at 150, came out at 130. That isn't a huge weight loss. Most of the guys will lose um, 20, sometimes up to 50 pounds during the school because you're um, calorically deficient and then you don't get a lot of sleep. So you start burning muscle when you're trudging through the woods with the pack on your back. Well, so I went in at a, as 150 pounds and there was this young male soldier who went in at about 140 pounds. And when I started shedding my extra weight, I had um, notionally died. So he had to pick up my body because you never leave a fallen comrade, right? He had to pick me up and run with me. And while he's running with me, he starts laughing. He's like, I am so glad you lost weight, Jaster, because a month ago I couldn't have picked you up. And it's it was a slap in the face to me because it was all of a sudden I realized that, wait a second here, everything that people are worried about women shouldn't do in the infantry because a woman couldn't evac evacuate a casualty because women aren't as strong as men. Well, the criteria is strength. It's not gender. Right. Because if you have a smaller man or somebody who's not physically fit, he's as much of a liability as a woman who has that same um, those same categories of being weaker or not physically fit. So it wasn't, it wasn't a gender thing. So we need to delete the adjective and focus on merit. Did that go through your mind in the moment when you were being carried out? And, and, and I want, I want to be clear. If I understood you correctly, you needing to be carried out was a part of an exercise where your role yes. was to be the person who got carried. Not that you decided you couldn't walk. Yes. I, I was dead. Right. right. <laughs> and, and it's, it's actually funny because rarely would they let me be the casualty because they always wanted you to, the instructors wanted to challenge the students. So they would usually kill off the 220 pound dude mm -hmm. that, you know, is impossible for anybody. <laughs> to carry. So the mere fact that they were allowing um, my squad mates to carry me was a blessing in disguise because I was one of the smaller students, but yeah, it's, it was, um, it was a realization in the moment. This wasn't, um, I had had the same argument over and over again about merit-based uh, decision-making. And when this occurred, no matter how tired I was or what I felt like, it was the perfect instance. Right then and there, I knew I'm like, this is the example. This is exactly what people need to understand is it's not based on male or female, it's based on strength. It's based on ability to do the job when the job is being asked of you. How do we start to measure that kind of stuff outside of physical tasks or, or any task that allows us to say check complete when, when I'm at the reason I'm asking that question is there is perhaps never been a time in the history of our country where we started to slide off of the meritocracy slope faster than we are right now. Yes. Yes. And so I'm, I have three daughters and a wife, right? None of them are going to be identified by the gender they were born and then decided that this is what they can accomplish in their life as a result of. Right. At least that, I, I think that's part of my job to ensure that, that that never happens. Yes. How do we start to look at things that are less tangible, that are more subjective, but that on the face of it, we're like, that's good. And that's not, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Like this person can do it and this person can't and, and maintain that level of meritocracy that, that you and I, I think would uh, agree is necessary. 
Again, I'm going to answer your question with a story. I so, like stories. Uh, as, as a West Point grad, I am privileged enough to be on one of the um, committees that chooses who gets uh, congressional nominations from the state of Texas to go to the military academies. This is the first year I was involved in it. It was an absolutely fantastic experience. Back in 1995, when I was applying, 1996, when I went to West Point, they had in-person interviews. Well, some offices, and I, you know, I can't speak for all of them, in the state of Texas have gotten away from the in-person interviews. And our, the resumes we look at are now completely blanked out from any identifiers. And that meaning is no, no, meaning no name, no gender, no name, no gender. If um, they talk about their immigrant parents, the country of origin is right. blacked Damn. out. So there can be as little bias as you can make it. And so I'm seeing I'm seeing transcripts, grades. I'm seeing fitness tests. I'm seeing extracurricular activities. I'm seeing volunteer work. And none of it says he or she, none of it says black, white, Hispanic. Um, there is nothing in there that identifies the adjectives. And because of that, the lists that come out have actually been more diverse. Interesting. Because people, you know, people push hard. And sometimes it's we'll have more women candidates than male candidates. Sometimes we'll have more white male candidates than anything else. And it'll just fluctuate because it's truly based on merit. But the cross section ends up being everybody's pushing hard to be good at what they do rather than being a slave to their adjectives. And we create a level of incompetence by letting people use their adjectives as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's bad to have we have a West Point women's group. I think it's great. I think being a woman and being part of the female community is fantastic, but I don't want to get a job or lose a job because of that uh, bucket I've been placed in. So really to go back to answer your question is how do we go back to a meritocracy or more focused on meritocracy? I think we need to de-emphasize our buckets and force people to be competitive in the bulk. Now, I'm not saying get rid of men and women's sports, because again, men and women are different, but there are a lot of female shooters that are absolutely amazing. My brother is um, used to be a volunteer police officer and he would teach sh classes out at the range. And he said he absolutely loved female shooters. And I thought, all right, come on, sexist, tell me why you like the female shooters better than mm -hmm. the males. It's like they're, they listen, they're more attentive, they're more direct, they have no issues taking single shots, they're not trying to go out there and bah, 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 bah. like they really focused on getting that one perfect shot before they start doing multiple shots or taking it to the next stage. And that's not all women, but we're not, we don't have to have, we don't have to have separate groups. But there are there are women that are good at men's activities and there are men that are good at women's activities. And if we don't let the others apply, we're probably losing our opportunity to recruit the the best asset for a team. What you were talking about at the shooting school is is of course it's not all women. Right. But there is a there is an um, insinuated selection of the woman who would go to the shooting school as compared to the woman who wouldn't, and even the man who would go to the shooting school compared to the man who wouldn't go. And I imagine, I can only speak as a man, I've never been a woman, um, but the, the woman who would go to that school would understand the um, the perhaps biases that mm -hmm. are going to be thrown out there when, when she arrives. And so overcoming those by being the model student uh, is an opportunity that I I, I, I just think that's interesting. Are you yeah, and on, on those same lines, you know, how many guys are told that you have to be good at this? So they won't ask questions. And, oh, 100%. And so, so a lot of that's in the parenting too, right? It, it was okay for my son to do gymnastics. It's okay for my daughter to do wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be totally cool if my daughter wants to do ballet and not, I'm also a cheer coach, just mm -hmm. so you know. For the last four years, I've been a cheer coach because I signed my daughter up for other sports and she wanted to be a cheerleader. So, okay. 
Right. You know, it, I'm not saying you can't do typically feminine or typically masculine things. I'm just saying if you don't want to, that's okay too. Are you familiar with Rachel Balkovic? No, it sounds like I need to be. I'll introduce you. She's okay. a, she's a friend of mine. She was the first, uh, female strength coach in professional baseball. And now the first female manager of a professional baseball team. She's a minor, a minor league team for the New York Yankees. And one of the, and I have, I have a ton of respect for her. And one of the things that she has said time and time again is yes, there are very few females represented in this field. Yes. There are also far fewer females applying for jobs in this field than there are men. And so if we're going to look at this part of the, you know, quote problem, we need to also look at this factor that contributes to the problem. And if you want to see that level, that playing field level, start applying more often. And I, I just, I have a lot of respect for anybody, male, female, black, white, it doesn't matter your religion who looks at an opportunity and says, I'm going to go for that yeah. because I, why wouldn't I go for that? You know, I've done, um, this is the world I live in is the, the diversity discussions. And I don't know how deep you want to get into it, but one of the things I talk about with, um, corporate clients is when they're looking for diversity, I've actually had clients say, Hey, I need a black female on staff. And it's, you don't need to hire somebody of a certain demographic. You need to recruit in demographics that previously didn't know these jobs existed. What does that mean? So, so, so now we, we can go deep there or deeper there. I had a, I met with a diversity recruiter for a while because I felt like at our company, we were very much more white mm-hmm. than our client base. And I was mm-hmm. like, I, I, I didn't, it wasn't that I was looking for the next black hire or mm-hmm. the next white hire. It was everybody who applied was white. And I was like, how do I get somebody who's not white to apply for a job and be the person who should be hired? Like enough of that, that it's not right. The one. And she said, uh, she gave me some really good suggestions and they've actually all manifested in the right people applying Mm -hmm. for the jobs. And that doesn't mean if a black person and a white person applied, I take the black person if they're equal. That's not what it means at all. It just meant that she provided us ways to get attention of people who don't look like everyone else in the company to understand there's a possible role for you here. So when you're talking about that, what do you mean by recruiting in communities that that look like the person you want to hire? I think, I think targeting targeted recruiting can, can go the right way or the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that when you have a company that's very monochromatic or, um, you know, I need to clarify. So diversity is a lot more than color, sure. a pretty cornucopia. Mm-hmm. And when I'm looking for diversity, I'm usually looking for diversity of thought mm-hmm. and diversity of thought. Part of that is the other two categories of diversity. And that's the visual, the one everybody knows you can see it, mm-hmm. um, whether it's religion, you can see it by the way they worship or the, whatever, and the diversity of experience, experiential diversity. So that's, I'm a hunter. I like to hunt. You put me in a room with someone from any religion, any country, any gender, any make, model, whatever, who's a hunter, I can talk to them all day. Well, all day. the the reason that for me, I was looking for people of different colors on our team mm-hmm. was because I thought that it would change the way. That, and I, by the way, to be clear, I wasn't looking for a person of a different color. I was looking for people of different colors to be applying for jobs. Cause right. then I would know that we were reaching people of all types who thought that they could potentially have a role here. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because it changes the, from my experience, it changes the way that you think when you're around people who think differently than you and people yes. of different religions, different colors, different genders, generally speaking, will have different experience that will influence the way that they think, which has the opportunity to influence the way that I think as a result of being in close proximity with them. And so what happens with a lot of entrepreneurs, I went to X college, which is in a small town, fictitious, right? Which is in a small town. It's predominantly white neighborhood. Well, I'm going to recruit for my startup, 
if I want entry level employees, I'm going to recruit at that college or high school, which has whatever my demographic is, because that's where I came from. Familiar. So a, a great, easy example is, OK, we need to start recruiting from a historically black university or a historically Hispanic university. I live just north of San Antonio. Um, it's a huge Hispanic population. So going to UTSA, um, University of Texas, San Antonio and recruiting will automatically bring a more diverse population. But mm -hmm. if I go back to um, Plymouth, Wisconsin, where I grew up, there's no Hispanics there. There's very few African-Americans. There's there's very few anything but um, white Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm various Christians. Um, I don't want to say Protestants because it's like the Catholic church and the Lutheran church or the two hills in town. But, you know, um, if I go back and I recruit there, I'm just going to get more people that look like me, which means I'm also going to get more people that think like me. So I'm not going to have innovation in my company. I'm not going to have diversity of thought or diversity, visual diversity. Um, and I'm probably going to get a bunch of rednecks like me, which is fantastic and fun, but it's not a good business model. No. So Now, and I can, just like you said, you want to hire the best person for the job, but the best person for the job might not be in your hometown and in your demographic. So unless you cast that net wide, don't expect to catch many fish. Well, one of the things, so I think if you were starting a hunting company, it might be okay. And I don't hunt very often. I've hunted twice, but I think that I want to do it more. I want, I want to do it more. Trust me. It's, it's a, it's something I, I very much want to get into, just not bad enough to change my lifestyle to do it yet. Um, I My stereotype is you might be okay with a, a, a white redneck company if you were going back to Wisconsin to recruit, if that's what you call them, yeah. to recruit your your entire staff. Because that might be the, the largest demographic of people who do that and you're not interested in going after the 1% of people who are on the fence of maybe doing it. Right. Um but so somebody opens delete the adjective and then they finish it and they close it. What is success for you in regards to what is different about them on the other side? What did they learn in that book? What I have found is my naysayers, the people who are my worst critics on social media, on the interweb, my, my basement, dwellers, um, nine times out of the 10, they've never met anyone like me. They don't have anyone in their life who likes to do something who, who doesn't fit the mold. And I don't fit the mold. I want to look nice. I want to be pretty. I want to be treated like a lady, but I also have no problems uh, sitting in a tree for eight hours and um, staring into the woods. Or throwing you in a heel hook. Or what? Or throwing you into a heel hook. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good. I'm, I'm working on leg locks now that I got my brown belt. So, mm -hmm. um, or yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> so, so I like to do this full gamut of things and I need people to understand that people like me exist. And so when they open the book, I want them to, to come at, delete the adjective with all the doubts in their mind. Hey, women could have never done this. I did this when I was 20 and it almost broke me off. There's no way a 37 year old mother of two did it. And I want them to close the book on the other side and just say, okay, well, I wasn't really sure if anybody could have done it, but I think I believe Lisa did it because once, once somebody believes that one person could do it, then they have to believe that there might be two people out there who could accomplish something unexpected. And then eventually that grows into, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't judge a book by its cover because there are women out there who like to do non-typical uh, male things or, you know, things that aren't typical for women to enjoy. And so that's a long way to answer the question. What I want people to do is I want them to, to start and finish the book however they, they need to, to really, to really listen to my story and understand I was a round peg in a round hole. The school had been open since 1950 and never allowed women in it before. And in 2015, 19 of us showed up, ultimately three of us graduated and we were ranger school candidate worthy. 
Like we should have been allowed to go there and we fit the mold. We didn't look the part, but we fit. We were comfortable. We were happy. And once people realize that that small piece, I think moving forward, they'll be able to to look past the boxes we put ourselves in or the boxes we put others in and keep a little bit more open mind. And that will ultimately help with building diverse teams. If I can push you there a little bit, I think you did look the part. It's just the people didn't know that's what the part looked like. You know, it, it was the first opportunity for the part to look the way that you do. Yeah, I guess so. I, I also, I also, um, I want to make sure that I'm not, my, my interpretation of the way you describe what you want people to get from the book is not less than what, than what's possible. I don't think it's a book simply for women. It's, no. It sounds like the kind of book that if I was to read it, um, I would be able to believe that something for myself is possible that previously I didn't. And, and the simple glimmer of belief is what grows into the actions that lead to the thing happening, which lead to per- perhaps a completely different life than I would have lived otherwise. I think, I think in a nutshell saying that you should walk away from the book knowing that you shouldn't be driven by your adjectives as well as you shouldn't judge other people by their adjectives is a very succinct way of saying my goal for the book. Yeah. I like it. Thank you. If that sentence made any sense. Wow. It made some sense to me. I made a post about something similar the other day. Um, I forget exactly what I wrote, but it was along the lines of, I had a, um, a personal training client who was a medical advisor to the president when it was George W. Bush and then Obama after him. Uh, he was a advisor to WADA, the world anti-doping agency. Uh, very, 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 very decorated doctor. And when you look at him, he's the guy who would show up wearing khakis and a collared shirt for his workout. And then he would start with his list of demands for what we're going to do today. And I'm like, this is not how this is going to go at all, but I appreciate (laughs) your input. Um, and if you looked at him from the outside, you'd be like, this guy's a hundred pounds overweight. Who's he going to teach about living a healthy life? And the reason that he became a client of mine was because he said, I'm advising the president on healthier lifestyle. I should live what I'm advising. Yeah. And, 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 and so the adjective that you would look at this guy is old, fat, white, wealthy, doesn't work hard. Like th- this guy doesn't need to, do- and it was completely the opposite. It was just that he had spent a period of his life deprioritizing the element that best exemplified what he was trying to teach people not to yeah. be. Yeah. Um, final question for you is, and I've actually never asked this question of somebody, but I feel like you'll answer it well. Uh-oh. Is there anything that you believe is very important that most people don't? That most people don't. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know, something I get a lot of pushback on is um, a communication style. Something I feel is extremely important is that I'm more my communication so that you can hear me. Your, I need to speak to your ears, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people will really get frustrated when they put their message out there because people can't hear them. Well, it's not because they're not listening. It's because they can't hear you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't talk to, and this is, this is a big lesson I learned at Ranger School, and I've learned it in several points throughout my life working with various generations. I do a lot of um, generation jumping, working in oil and gas, uh, now working as a consultant in uh, leadership development. But the way a World War II vet hears you especially coming from, from this person is not the same as a high school senior who's trying to decide what college they're going to go to is going to hear you. But the message could be extremely similar. So I think something I feel strongly about that not everybody agrees on is if you truly want to be a leader, if you truly want to be influential, not an influencer, but influential, is you need to use the version of you that best communicates based on the recipient, I think that's great. I think it's a great answer. And, and, um, 
we're only getting to know each other right now, but uh, we have strong parallels on that one. And I've, I've learned that lesson the hard way myself as well. As a coach, as a, as Everything. what you do, yeah, you're, you're a life coach. You are helping people live a better life on a daily basis. And I'm, I'm sure you've hit lots of roadblocks in that venture. It, you know, uh, I think in a way we're all technically life coaches for people. Um, my responsibility as I see it professionally is to create a safe and inspiring work environment where our staff and clients can pursue a shared mission. And to do that, the person who needs me to tell them you did a shit job today, you need to do it differently next time needs to hear it like that. And the person who needs to hear what are the areas that you feel like we could improve on next time needs to hear it like that. And that's the exact same message to two people who, if spoken to in the other person's tone, feel unsafe and uninspired because they don't know what they're supposed to do or how they're supposed to take it. It's a perfect example. I I had to be taught that with a sledgehammer. <laughs> you, know, you know, a really great place to see that is I used to coach CrossFit mm-hmm. and I would walk through a class and if I had somebody I wasn't um, used to, uh, coaching, I would ask them how they wanted to be coached. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you hit minute 17 of a 20 minute workout, do you want me in your face or do you want me clapping or do you want to be left the F alone? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, those were their three choices because that's all I've got. And it, it's amazing how different people are with regards to what they react to. Oh yeah. I, I can tell you, I mean, you, you just tapped on a, uh, on a nerve and a rabbit hole that we could go down for the next several hours. If you want to switch the interview and you can start asking me questions. Uh, but I can, I can tell you, uh, having worked with thousands of CrossFitters and some of the, some of the best in the world, some of them at the games level would tell you, I like it when the other people cheer me on when I'm struggling in a workout. And some of them will tell you if I had a choice, I would, I would pick up a sword and cut their head off when they come over and start cheering me on. And so it isn't, it's the same thing at the, at the gym level. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't know what it says about me, but I'm the type of person, if I'm in the, um, the depths of it, I have to cheer someone else on. And that is the only way I can get out of the hole. Mm. Okay. I don't know if this says about you either. Yeah. No, <laughs> like when I'm running, if I start dragging, I start cheering everybody on around me and then I can, then I can run faster. But without that, I just, I just keep wallowing in more and more self-pity. All right. Well, I'll remember that if I'm ever looking for a running partner who will just cheer me on from behind. Yes. yes. <laughs> Cause I'm really slow. So I'll be way behind. Well, the suggestion, what I, what I meant by that was if, if I'm ahead of you and you're cheering for me, I'm going to feel like I need to keep going faster. Cause I don't want you to get ahead of me. <laughs> Lisa, where can people find you and where can people get your book when it comes out? Uh, the best place to get the book on January 31st is going to be on amazon.com. Just look up Lisa Jaster or delete the adjective. Um, I do have a website that's delete the adjective.com and I've got all the social medias. So it's just Lisa Jaster at Twitter, Lisa Jaster, um, delete the adjective on Facebook and Lisa A. Jaster on Instagram. We'll make sure we provide easy access for people in our store, in our show notes so they can find you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Live Podcast. Please remember, give us a hand, rate it, review it wherever you listen to shows. We are on a mission to humanize the healthcare industry by professionalizing the fitness industry to empower the individual to live a life unlimited by the way that their body looks, feels, or performs. If you are inspired by that mission and want to jump on the wagon, find us anywhere. Active Life Professional on Instagram, Active Life RX on Instagram. Come to me personally at Dr. Sean Pastuch. We want to welcome you onto the train. We want you to be a part of the mission. We want to offer you the opportunity to pursue this right alongside us. We're inspired by your effort and we hope to help you in your journey. Turn pro.